Coming up, the insane automotive arms race that we call heavy towing, how to crack the kooky code and avoid blowing the limit. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This towing thing, right, it is flat out out of control. I'm extremely concerned. That's not a joke. I am extremely concerned by it. There's all these people driving around right now in the outback with some incredible trailer behind their vehicle. They think they're okay. They are, in fact, massively overloaded. Let's talk about that. I know, it's delightfully liberating and uplifting to blame someone else, some other entity for all of your problems, but actually I think consumers are mainly responsible for this arms race because they drive demand. Consumers push demand out to car makers, they say, hey, want to tow three and a half tonnes, and I'd like to put a hot tub in the back of my SUV with the cheerleaders in it and tow it for, I don't know, 18 months right across Australia or something. And of course, the manufacturers of RVs and boat trailers and whatever else people tow, camper trailers, caravans, you know, they don't want to say no. They don't want to go, nah, mate, bad idea. Let's tone it down a bit. And certainly if they did, if either one of these groups did that and said, nah, mate, bad idea, the aftermarket industry would just step in in a heartbeat and pick up the slack. And in a sense, they're doing that already with things like GVM upgrade kits. Nobody, and we'll get to that, but nobody wants to say, hey, just have a good hard look at yourself. This objective of yours to tow something very, very heavy with a whole bunch of additional weight added to the vehicle, it's a bad idea. And I guess that's where I come in. If you want to understand towing at some deep, meaningful level, then there are six key things that you have to understand. The terminology, because it's nice if we all use the same words for the same stuff. The tear weight of the vehicle or the trailer is just dead empty. In the case of the vehicle, it includes notionally 10 litres of fuel in the tank. All the fluids are in there as well, in the diff and the gearbox and all of that stuff and the radiator, but not you and not your passengers and not your stuff, okay? The curb weight, which is actually much more widely used and more relevant, is just the tear weight with a full tank of fuel. So that's pretty easy to understand as well. The next thing you need to know is the GVM, or the gross vehicle mass. That is your vehicle fully loaded with you and all your stuff. Whatever you put in it, the passengers, the stuff, the accessories, the GVM is the total of the curb weight and all of the load that you add later. And if you're a tradie and you put a service body on the back of your ute, whatever, and all the tools, it's all of that as well. The next one, obviously, ATM, aggregate trailer mass. That's the same as GVM, only for your trailer. So that is how much your trailer weighs, absolutely fully loaded in its heavily loaded configuration for travel. And you need to know that as well. Tow ball download is important as well. And we'll get to that. It's basically just the amount of vertical download that the static trailer imposes on the tow ball of the vehicle. So once again, very easy to understand. And the final one, GCM, gross combination mass. It's just the fully loaded vehicle plus the fully loaded trailer rolling down the road. How much does the whole thing weigh? And in the case of you and towing your stuff, it means in its most heavily loaded configuration. And these things are presented as limits. There's a GVM limit. The manufacturer says the gross vehicle mass cannot be more than this. And they say the aggregate trailer mass, in the case of your trailer, the manufacturer will say aggregate trailer mass limit, blah, whatever it is. Tow ball download is a limit that the manufacturer of the vehicle specifies as is gross combination mass, particularly in the case of a ute. Okay, and you need to know all these limits. You need to not exceed the limits because if you do and you crash and there's an investigation, there's all kinds of negative connotations that go with that. Your insurance company might deny a claim. 
you might get sued for negligence by the party of, uh, you know, the family of someone who dies or is terribly injured. So there's that to consider. And there's also just getting pinged at the roadside for driving while you're overloaded. That's a huge problem as well, because if you're 3,000 kilometres from home or something, as you can be in many places here in Shitsville, then if you're over the gross combination mass, you get stopped and guess what? You don't go again until you fix this problem and then you have to decide what stuff you are going to divest yourself of and are you going to leave it at the roadside or how are you going to get it home? It's a nightmare, okay? This sort of stuff is just a logistic nightmare for you if you go out hoping for the best and not knowing whether you're within the bounds of the rules or outside. So I guess one of the critical things here that you need to consider is a GVM limit and what does that make up and how does that play out in reality, okay? So I just did a couple of back of the envelope sort of sketches of how that might look in a four wheel drive wagon, right? You might have three people, 80 kilos a piece, that's 240 kilos for the people. You might have a bull bar because they're very common out there as well. I think they're a bad idea, but hey, people buy them by the container load and they fit them to their vehicles. It's gonna be 40 kilos-ish for an aluminium bull bar. Your basic steel bull bar is gonna be twice that, about 80 kilos. If you've got a winch bar, that's gonna set you back about 110 kilos in the context of your GVM budget. So they're pretty heavy things and you'd wanna weigh up, do I actually need that or not? All this other stuff. You're going to need a tow bar, otherwise, why are you watching this video? You might carry some fuel, another 20 kilos there, jerry can of fuel, some water. That's always a good idea if you break down in the desert. Nice to have a bit of water. Some tools, they're pretty heavy. Doesn't take many tools to tip the scales at 20 kilos. Some luggage, six or seven kilos per person. Three people, 20 kilos for some luggage. An extra spare tire, always nice to double your mobility in the middle of nowhere, I'd suggest. And another 20 kilos of miscellaneous, this and that, I don't know, a radio, GPS receiver, first aid kit, whatever it is, 20 kilos. The total, worryingly enough, and this does not seem like the pimp's Cadillac of, you know, off-road adventuring setups to me. This seems pretty bare bones. Three people in this stuff, 500 kilos, half a ton in the old money, all right? So that's a significant load and it's very easy to exceed it. So let's just think about the configuration of your trailer and the loads that it imposes, okay? This is what's known in the beer garden physics trade of engineering as a free body diagram. Here's your trailer, the mass centroid, the center of mass of the trailer, the center of gravity, whatever you want to call it, slightly forward of the axle so that it imposes a little bit of download on the tow ball. This is gravity, can't escape gravity, sadly. It would be terribly liberating if you could though. 3,500 kilos, that's your three and a half ton trailer, which is basically the pimp's Cadillac of allowable trailers here in Australia. So what happens to that three and a half tons? How is it opposed? And the answer is, well, 90% of it typically is opposed by the ground that it rolls on. And another 10% up here of tow ball download. And here in Australia, 10% is very common for the tow ball download. And that increases things like dynamic stability as you're rolling down the road. It's particularly bad for the, you know, the trailer to start lifting the back wheels of your vehicle off the road. So, a little bit of download. According to Toyota, the target is 9 to 11%. That's in their towing guide, which you can download. We'll get to that. Now, you might be confused by this. This is an arrow that's up, and it's typically referred to as tow ball download. This is just Newton's third law of motion, okay? This is gravity being opposed by this reaction and this reaction. The tow ball is pushing up on the trailer and so is the road. It stops the trailer falling into the road, which is always nice. So if you were gonna do the same sort of diagram for the vehicle, you would have 350 kilos down on the tow ball. And that's the reaction from the vehicle. The tow ball pushes back because the ass of the vehicle doesn't fall into the road either. If you don't get that because you, know, you didn't do a lot of physics at school or you didn't study engineering, whatever, just trust me on this. This is how the forces play out when that trailer is coupled 
to the vehicle or even when it's sitting on its little jockey wheel because when the jockey wheel is there it's doing what the tow ball would otherwise do when the trailer is coupled to the vehicle. The worst thing about all of this is that this tow ball download is part of the GVM of the vehicle, okay? And that has some major implications in the context of what you can legally carry with the vehicle. Okay, so the next thing you've got to realize is that the four-wheel drive wagons, like your Land Cruiser or something, they're typically limited by the gross vehicle mass. That's the manufacturer's specification of what the fully loaded vehicle can weigh. It's a limit, okay? Your utes are typically limited by the gross combination mass because without a trailer, they're designed to carry a lot of load, obviously. So utes are typically limited by the combination, which is the heavily loaded trailer plus the heavily loaded vehicle. You can't go over that limit. Let's look at how that plays out. You got your Land Cruiser 200, okay? It's got a GVM of 3,350 kilos, which is significant. The curb weight, 2740. So the payload that you can sit in the vehicle, this is without a trailer, is 610 kilos, which is kind of okay, but the vehicle's got eight seats. It's not like it's impossible to overload. However, if you hook up the Taj Mahal of trailers and it imposes that 10% download on the tow ball, that 350 kilos, then you've got to take that away from the 610. The payload that's left is only 260 kilos. And that is dead easy to overload in the context of all of those loads that we mentioned earlier, you know, three people at 80 kilos is 240 kilos. And of all that other stuff that you might put in the vehicle, you know, a bit of luggage, a few tools, blah, 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 the bull bar, the roof rack, whatever, the tow bar, what are you going to lose, okay? Because you may not blow this limit. In the context of a ute, you know, Ranger Wild Track is insanely popular. It's got a three and a half ton tow limit, just like the Cruiser. And, you know, when you take that into consideration, you've got your 6,000 kilos gross combination mass. That's the fully loaded vehicle plus the fully loaded trailer may not exceed six tons. You take away the aggregate trailer mass of your Taj Mahal trailer, three and a half tons, and you take away the curb weight, 222 kilos. That's the maximum payload. So what are you going to lose in the context of all of those things that I listed before that might go in your ute? What are you not going to carry so that you can tow 3.5 tonnes? And that's why I think this three and a half ton limit is flat out insane. Stand on a highway and have a look at how many vehicles driving down the road, these four-wheel drive adventuring vehicles on the school holidays. When the school holidays kick off, have a look at all of those families escaping and just look at the vehicles and have a think about how many of those are blowing these limits. And just so you think that I am not, just so you know that I am not just cherry picking the data here, I did a whole bunch of other utes and wagons as well. So let's go through them because there's some interesting conclusions there. The Land Cruiser and the Wild Track we just discussed, the 260 and the 222, okay? Your Ranger XLT is 100 kilos lighter than the Wild Track. And the way this plays out is it derives an additional 100 kilos of payload when you've got that Taj Mahal trailer on the back because this is like spare mass that is not exploited by all of the additional equipment that the wild track carries around with it every day of its life, okay? So you can actually load up and tow more easily with an XLT. And if you think that's good, have a look at the other Ranger, the Mazda BT-50, in particular, the High Rider XTR, because it is not four-wheel drive. It's a two-wheel drive ute with ground clearance, okay? XTR is not the bare bones spec either. It's roughly equivalent to XLT. But because that vehicle doesn't have a front cross axle diff, it doesn't have a front prop shaft, it doesn't have a big fat transfer case with low range gearing, right? You get a lot of mass saving in the curb weight there and that translates directly to a big benefit in the payload that you can carry when you are towing Taj Mahal trailer. A lot of people buy the Wild Track because, hey, it's the best. Mate, got to have the best. In fact, it's not the best at towing. You do much better at towing in, in the context of loading the vehicle with a High Rider XTR Mazda BT-50. 
and I bet that might spark quite a few arguments in pubs around the country this weekend. And I'm happy if it does. You know, your Triton GLS Premium. Interesting story about the Triton. Mitsubishi is sort of cutting against the grain here because they're not part of the arms race. Mitsubishi's kind of said, hey, 3.1 tonnes is our towing limit. If they said 3.5, okay, you'd take 400 kilos off that, you'd be at 343. I hope that makes sense. 343 is not that bad in the context particularly of Land Cruiser 200 and Wild Track. It's pretty good. Anyway, Mitsubishi doesn't play that game and a lot of people go, ah oh, mate, she's only got 3.1 tonnes of tow capacity. In fact, Triton's tow capacity is much more rational and in terms of the vehicle's performance at 3.1 tonnes worth of trailer, it's right up there with everything else. Not so, I think, with the Hilux Rugged X, which is a direct competitor to the Wild Track. It can tow, according to Toyota, a maximum trailer, ATM, of 3.2 tonnes. And when you crunch the numbers on that, right, 198 kilos is the maximum payload. That's you and your dog and a few tools. Like, come on. It's just nuts. It's nuts to put 3.2 tonnes worth of trailer behind a rugged X Hilux. It just is. Your Amarok Core 4 motion, as much as I hate criticize, as much, sorry, as much as I hate praising Volkswagen in any context, they haven't done too bad with the arithmetic here, right? Because 409 kilos with the 3.5 tonne trailer. And interestingly enough, and I know Santa Fe Highlander does not compete with any of these vehicles above. It's not a hardcore off-roader. Its maximum tow capacity is only two tonnes. In standard trim, the tow ball download limit is 100 kilos, not the 350 kilos or the you know, 310 kilos in the case of the Triton, right? It's a comparatively underdone tow package in the context of all of these vehicles. You can put the optional genuine load assist kit accessory on the Santa Fe and increase the tow ball download limit to 150 kilos. And when you do that, you put a two ton trailer behind with your 150 kilos worth of download, Santa Fe Highlander will carry 485 kilos. And it's a seven seat vehicle. And I'd put it to you that this is a much more rational limit for a wagon as well. And I know it doesn't have low range, it's not a hardcore adventurer, but when we're just considering tow capacity, you tell me what's, what's more rational. Is it the Santa Fe setup or is it the Land Cruiser 200 setup? To me, it's the Santa Fe every time, just in the context of what is a rational limit for the population out there to understand and not get massively wrong because, hey, they haven't got a PhD in towing physics. So just to piss off everybody in the Toyota Fanboy Club, okay, and that's almost but not quite the only reason why I'm doing that, let's just do a comparison, okay, between the 200 series with a trailer on the back that imposes 150 kilos worth of download. So this is a light trailer in the context of 200 series, and we'll put the same trailer on a Santa Fe Highlander. 150 kilo download, that's the maximum for the Santa Fe, all right? And we'll look at the payload that those two vehicles can carry in that load carrying configuration. So this is like a scientific test, okay? And the experimental control is tow ball download. It's constant trailer, variable payload. What can it carry, all right? The Land Cruiser, 460, Santa Fe, 485. That's surprising, right? And the kindest I can be about this is they're kind of the same. It's only 25 difference. It's about 5%, I guess. So that's counterintuitive as well. Everyone would think that, hey, a light trailer with 150 kilos worth of download, Land Cruiser would just shrug and go, yeah, bring it. Put two on the back. <laughs> Have fries with that. Supersize me, baby. Santa Fe is actually better at carrying payload in the vehicle when you've got that trailer on the back. And that is so counterintuitive, but it's based on the numbers. And once again... I admit Santa Fe is not a hardcore adventurer, no low range gear set. I know which vehicle I'd rather power up a big steep sand dune. I know which vehicle I'd rather drive through a deep river, etc. Okay, but when it comes to loading up with a light trailer on the back, 150 kilos, gotta be in the Santa Fe. 
Now that we've said goodbye to the entire Toyota fanboy audience, I suggest you do this, okay? Google the words Waybridge, public Waybridge in your area. Find the local public Waybridge and trot off to it in your vehicle with your trailer, both of which in their most heavily laden configurations. So the first thing you wanna do is drive the trailer onto the Waybridge, decouple, get the jockey wheel on the ground and drive the tow vehicle off. Take that weight. Then back back up, recouple, and then just drive the vehicle off. So the vehicle's wheels are not on the scales, but the trailer is, okay? And take that reading. And then drive off and uncouple, and then just drive the vehicle in its most heavily laden configuration onto those scales. And if you carry passengers, Get those passengers into that vehicle as well, just so you know. And if you've got those three measurements, that's incredibly valuable because you can figure out the gross combination mass. Just add number one and number three, and you're off to the races. You compare that to the gross combination mass limit specified by the vehicle manufacturer and make sure you're under it. And if you're not, you've got to figure out what to leave behind. It's that simple. Number two is you can figure out your tow ball download. That's dead easy as well. It's just this one here minus that one there and then compare that to the vehicle's limit as well and just make sure you're not over it. And obviously your GVM comes out here at number three and just compare that to the vehicle manufacturer's GVM limit and make sure you're under it. Once again, you're off to the races. Most people don't measure this. They just hope for the best and it is flat out insane. And if you want to think like a mathematics head on this, it's pretty easy to do this like an equation, all right? Gross vehicle mass is the curb weight plus the download on the tow ball plus the payload that you carry. That's how this works. That's the relationship between those three variables and gross vehicle mass. This is a limit set by the manufacturer and you may not exceed it. And so is that. But you might want to rearrange that equation in the context of doing some expedition planning because it's nice to know how much payload you're allowed to carry. And that depends on the specs for GVM minus the curb weight, which is also in the specs, minus the download that your trailer imposes on the vehicle. When you know these things, you can plan how much payload you're allowed to carry. And likewise, with gross combination mass, which is the heavily laden vehicle plus the heavily laden trailer, that's a limit specified by the manufacturer. It's the curb weight plus the heavily loaded weight of the trailer, the aggregate trailer mass, plus the payload that you carry in the vehicle. You can rearrange that as well for expedition planning. The payload you have to plan for is the gross combination mass minus the curb weight minus the fully loaded weight of your trailer. And that can help you it can go a hell of a long way to you getting the payload right before you head to the Waybridge and before you head out on the road. And you really do need to know these things and pay close attention to them because if not, you know, it can be a financial and or logistic disaster for you. And I've got a couple of other points that I want to mention just before we finish. The first thing I strongly suggest you do here is go to the internets and type in Toyota Basic towing guide. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's a really good short document, okay? It's only 12 or 13 meaningful pages long. It's full of easy to digest facts about towing, good advice about setting up the vehicle and the trailer, and apart from the occasional lawyer-esque disclaimer, it's on the money and easy to digest. And much of it corroborates the kind of stuff I've mentioned here, such as tow ball download absolutely being part of the vehicle's GVM. So you'd want to digest that as well if you know what's good for you. The second thing we need to talk about here is what to do if you're not happy with the payload capacity left over when you've maxed out your trailer. Because a lot of people find themselves in this position. And after a few clicks, and a bit of Googling, they find out that there is a GVM upgrade kit available in the aftermarket industry for their vehicle. Pedders does one. Here's the flyer for the 200 series GVM upgrade kit, which allegedly adds 370 kilos to the payload. And I don't think that number is an accident, right? Because it's about the payload you lose when you've got your 350 kilos of tow ball download on board. And basically what this kit comprises, as far as I can tell from the website, is certification plus 
four new springs and four new dampers. And you've got to think about it like this, haven't you? Because how easy would it be for Toyota to add four different springs and four different dampers to every 200 series on the road or every one that they sell from this point forward and just give that vehicle another 370 kilos of GVM capacity, right? Because it's easy for a car maker to stick springs and dampers in the vehicle. They're going to do it anyway. It's not like there would be a significant additional cost involved. And it's not like they like turning customers away because the vehicle can't carry what they want it to carry. So why don't they? And the answer is there must be some conservative type engineering reason that they don't put in the brochure, obviously, but it's got to be there. And you've got to ask yourself also, if you go out and do this in the aftermarket industry, obviously there is a warranty supplied by the manufacturers of these kinds of kits, but does that extend to things like the powertrain if the powertrain fails because you've overloaded the vehicle? And that is flat out not clear. How would you prove that the vehicle has not failed as a result of the additional load that you've been carrying across our fine brown land? Here's what Toyota says about things like that. And you'll excuse me if I quote from their basic towing guide. It says, warranty limitations, this is on like page nine, warranty limitations operating the vehicle in an overloaded condition or outside of Toyota's recommendations may void the vehicle warranty. You've got to think about how carefully that's worded and whether the lawyers signed off on that, okay? Outside of Toyota's recommendations, operating the vehicle outside of Toyota's recommendations. So I went out and I looked for any recommendation that Toyota has on the record in the public domain that upgrading the vehicle's GVM is one of the things they recommend you do if you're not happy with it. And guess what? Knock me down with a friggin' feather, it's not there. So I'd suggest that if you've just paid 125 grand or something for a Land Cruiser Sahara and you go and fit this GVM upgrade, then haven't you just walked a pretty tight line there with your warranty and possibly stepped right over it in the event of a major transmission or other powertrain type failure? Because you are imposing a great deal of additional load on that vehicle and you're operating it outside of Toyota's recommendations. And it could easily be that you'll end up in a he said, she said kind of problem where you're going, vehicle manufacturer, got a problem. They go, take it up with the GVM upgrade dudes. And you go, well, GVM upgrade dudes look after me here. And they go, not our problem. And you're in the middle hiring lawyers and independent technical experts when what you really want to be is, I don't know, out there enjoying the outback. I also want to talk to you directly if you are that Taj Mahal wannabe tower, because I'd suggest that in my view, it is a very bad idea to tow a van that is heavier than the curb weight of your vehicle. I think that is just opening the door to disaster. And it's not fun. I mean, come on, I've had fun towing something that weighs three and a half tons in a vehicle that weighs two and a half that's not fun. It's never going to be fun. There are vans out there that you can tow legally, bad idea, but legally, they're longer than nine metres. They're taller than three metres. They're two and a half frigate metres wide. You're not getting away from it all when you tow a van like that. You're taking it all friggin' with you. And I, I found a van just like that, and I have no reason to doubt that it is a poor quality product. I just think it might be a bad idea to try and tow it with a friggin' Land Cruiser or a Ford Ranger Wild Track etc. as discussed earlier. This thing, excuse me for referring to my notes but it's convoluted, it's called a Zone RV Z-22.6 Club Summit. <laughs> okay, it's got a three and a half ton maximum trailer load, ATM, okay? 175 kilograms on the ball. So they've done a really smart thing there. They've reduced the ball load. Instead of 10%, they're using 5%. And that obviously imposes less of a compromise on the payload that the vehicle can carry if you're GVM limited, as you would be in a Land Cruiser, right? You get another 175 kilos worth of stuff that you can put in the vehicle, basically. So that's good. Does it mean this is still a good idea? I don't think so. I really don't. This thing, incidentally, is $190,000. It's a so-called off-road caravan, okay? So I've got no doubt that it's rugged and built with high quality whatever and I got no doubt that it's a good van, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying 
is it a good idea for you to tow it across the nation for months and months on end in a vehicle like a Land Cruiser? And I would suggest to you, no, it is not. And this is not because of the van, it's because of the vehicle you're towing it with. I'd suggest if you want to tow something like that, buy a friggin' truck. In fact, if you'd like to tow anything that weighs more than two and a half tons, don't buy a four wheel drive ute in the manner of a Hilux or Ranger, and don't buy a 200 series, buy a truck, because that's what you need, and it will cope with that much better. Buy a four wheel drive truck if you wanna go out back adventuring and you know beat the wilderness into submission even harder or something. But don't try and do it with a Land Cruiser because that's a mistake. And PS, 190 grand, come on, 190 grand is like 380 nights worth of accommodation in some hotel at 500 bucks a night. That's more than a year away at 500 bucks a night. Now, traveling in the outback, if you can't have breakfast and dinner and get decent accommodation for an average of 500 bucks a night, then I'd suggest to you that you are really not trying really so not trying. You could probably stay away for two years. And then guess what? Where you stay, you just, the, the room is clean. You turn up, you dirty the room up a bit. You get your breakfast, you, it gets cooked for you. So there's that. And PS, dinner, same thing. You leave the room a bit dirty. Someone cleans it up after you've left and you don't have to tow anything when you go to your next hotel. And you can do that like nearly 400 friggin' times or you can tow a dirty big van for 190 grand. I guess it's up to you. But in my world, okay, if there's a hell, it involves that kind of towing over and over and over for the rest of eternity. Now, just for balance, is it ever a good time to tow three and a half tons with one of those vehicles we've been discussing, like the Land Cruiser or the Utes? And I'd suggest, yes, there is a few times when you can make a compelling case for towing the Taj Mahal of vans with a vehicle such as that. And the first one is, when you buy that Taj Mahal and you want to install it semi-permanently at a favourite location like a caravan park up the coast, fine, you tow it up there once and then you just drive backwards and forwards without towing anything and just go and install it up there if that's your thing. That kind of makes sense. The second time I'd suggest it makes sense to tow that big heavy load with a vehicle like that is if it's a boat and that boat is installed at your house on a trailer and you take it every second or third weekend to the nearest boat ramp and you enjoy the local waterways. That's not that demanding when you think about it because you don't have to carry significant payload in the vehicle. It's not gonna be overloaded. It's a short drive. It's not that demanding. You gotta be on the case while you're doing it, obviously, but it makes sense to do that. There's a big difference, I'd suggest, between doing that and towing three and a half tons around the friggin' country for months on end. I guess finally, the other time that it makes sense to do that heavy towing in a vehicle like a ute is if you're a, some sort of contractor or a tradie, you might have an implement like a big heavy excavator that just tips the scales with the trailer at three and a half tons. And occasionally you need to move it from site to site to get the job done. And you might be able to arrange that without driving the vehicle overloaded you're probably not gonna be driving several hundred kilometers at a time. It's probably gonna be a short trip from this site to that site within your local geographic area, more or less. To me, that kind of makes sense as well. But for everyone else, particularly the Grain Nomad fraternity, the GVM upgrades, insanity. The vehicle, the tow vehicle, that is much lighter than the vehicle it is towing, that is insanity. If you're gonna to tow something that's two and a half tons, instead of doing that, just make some airline reservations, check yourself into a hotel or buy that friggin' truck because if you've got 190,000 bucks to spend on that Taj Mahal of vans, I'd suggest you've also got the cash for the truck that will carry you around the nation much better, much more easily, and importantly, much safer. 